buongiorno. Benvenuto a classe di Colicchio. I'm sorry. Hello. Welcome to Colicchio's classroom. Today we're going to be talking about the Italian Renaissance, a period in time in the 13th or the 15th or 16th century that lasted in Italy. And what happened in those 400 years was an insanely important time in modern European history. Now, the word Renaissance means rebirth, but was it actually a rebirth? Did we just forget about all the craziness that had happened before the Middle Ages? A lot of people in that time thought so. To understand the Renaissance better, we're going to take a look at the Persia, P-E-R-S-I-A acronym in my previous video, and break down the Renaissance. And we're going to not really debate whether it was an actual rebirth, but we're just going to go through and talk about the important aspects and how to remember it for all those tests that you got to take later in the year. All right, let's dive in. Before we talk about the P, we're going to talk about the A, which stands for area or geography. Obviously, the Italian Renaissance began in Italy. Wow, go figure. Who knew? If you don't know what Italy looks like, it's the boot-shaped uh, country in Europe that's kicking the island of Sicily into the Mediterranean Sea. Five seas actually surround Italy, the Ligurian, the Tyrrhenian, the Mediterranean, the Ionian, and the Adriatic Sea. There's also a couple major mountain ranges, the Alps to the north and the Apennines, which run parallel to the entire country's uh, middle of the boot. Italy has major cities such as Rome, Milan, Florence, and Venice, and of course, Sicily, its island, as well as Sardinia, another island. Corsica is actually owned by France, so it doesn't really count. So now that we've talked about the area and the geography, let's go to the P. To understand the political side of the Renaissance, you're going to have to understand the type of government that existed. That type of government is known as a city-state, or better known as a city that's its own country. If you remember ancient Greece, you'll remember the rivalry between the two city-states of Athens and Sparta. Or you'll remember people's rippling biceps and abs. Either or. But what you need to know about city-states is that those cities are very powerful and that doesn't create unification. Italy today is a unified country if you don't count the city-states of the Vatican and of course San Marino, which are both echoes of Italy's city-state past. If we look at the map today, we'll notice that it was a cluster of different city-states that created this Italian peninsula of city-state mayhem. The two types are a signoria and a republicanism type of city-state. Under a signoria, you have one person from one family that has a lot of power in that area. However, there are no elections, and that person chooses who the successors are after them. Signoria would happen under cities where there were not a lot of money. Genoa, Padua, Verona, these small cities where there are primarily farmers. Now, if we look at republicanism, this is where the richer families exist. And there's a lot of them, and there's always a power struggle, it seems. So what they did was they worked together. It's every poor person's nightmare when rich people come together and try to make their lives worse. Two examples of republicanism city-states existed in the cities of Florence and Venice, which both had a lot of money from trade and from banking. Florence, the home of the Renaissance, was home to the Medici family, a family we're going to talk about a little bit more once we get to the intellectual aspect. But for now, that's the P. Let's go to the E. The economic reasons for why the Renaissance began in Italy can be summed up in one major point. It was raining money from the sky. Okay, that's not entirely true. However, the cities of Florence, Venice, and Milan were all doing very well because of trade, especially Venice trading pepper with the Muslim Turks from the Ottoman Empire. It was through this trade that they were able to bring in a lot of money and finance the arts, becoming patrons of the arts. In Florence, you heard a new industry called banking. Yes, I know, this weird thing that you probably have never gone to. However, through banking, especially through the Medici family, they were able to make a lot of money through interest, you know, loaning money out, then collecting it with money given back. If you don't understand how interest works, wait till your student loans. You'll understand interest real quickly. Through that, wealthy families became wealthier, and through that, they were able to finance the art that went into the Renaissance. <laughs> understand the religious aspect of the Renaissance, you have to take a look at religion 
during the Middle Ages. Because religion, especially Christianity, during the Middle Ages in Europe, it was a dominating factor. The church arguably had more power than the kings in most areas in Europe. Because people were terrified that at any point in their life they could die and they might end up in hell instead of heaven. Now with the Renaissance that began to change. People aren't becoming completely secular. They're not trying to wash away religion from their aspect like they will during the Enlightenment. However, they are starting to do more things that are fun. And so with these things that are fun, they're painting pictures, they're building buildings, they're doing them in the name of God. However, they might not have any connection to God or Jesus or Christianity, but they're saying that they do. Those people that are patrons like the Medicis, it doesn't really matter much to them. But however, when the papacy or the Pope start to get involved and they start, you know, building elaborate palaces and they start paying people to make, you know, beautiful paintings for them in the Sistine Chapel and that costs thousands and thousands of modern day dollars, people are going to start wondering where's that money coming from? And it's going to start getting people into debt. And, you know, you look at the place, or excuse me, the papacy, it's not a rich, wealthy city in Rome like it is in Venice. They're going to have to start charging people. So how does a church start charging people? Well, they start telling you that you have to pay to go to heaven, just like they were doing with indulgences, which will lead us to the Reformation. So that's enough of religion. Let's talk about the S. To understand the social changes of the Renaissance, you're going to have to understand the idea of humanism, or the idea that people do things for themselves, not for God, not for Jesus, not for the Pope, not for any religious implications, but for themselves. However, back then, that's a little bit different. Renaissance humanism is doing things for yourself and focusing on the person instead of focusing just completely on religion. You can make pictures of art that aren't completely religious. You can go out and paint a picture of a landscape. You can go out and paint pictures of naked people. And that's totally fine. That's cool. As long as it's got some sort of religious implication, then it's fine. That's why you can go to the Sistine Chapel in Rome, the head of the Catholic Church, and find a lot of naked people in that church. It's true. Been there seen it. There were also a lot of non-humanist changes in the social aspect. The first thing being that more peasants were becoming legally free from their fiefs. And if you don't know what a fief is, it is a plot of land that you are legally tied to. Um, you could say peasant, you can say serf, either or. There was also this idea that rich people were expected to be more aristocratic-like. They had to be born a noble, they have to have military training, and they have to be classically educated. This is all coming from Castiglione's Book of the Courtier, and in this book he basically tells rich people to be snobbier. It's incredible. It's great. Now, there's also an emerging social class called the merchants, and we talked about this with Venice and Florence and Milan. People that are trading are making a lot of money, so you would want to be, it's like being a pharmaceutical rep in the 90s. You're going to make a lot of money. You want to definitely be that. So merchant class was like the pharmaceutical reps for the renaissance. They were bringing in a lot of money and therefore with more money they were ascending in social class power. People started to respect them more, they had more government control, and they dominated society. Now if we look at the family structure, it's Europe, it's the 13th to 14th century, men rule the family. True story, you weren't actually an adult at 18 like you are in America. Your father had to go to like a courthouse and legally emancipate you, say, yeah, he's not my kid anymore. He's his own man. Women, congratulations, you were the household managers and you, your main job was to birth the children. Childbirth, however, was not a very preferred option. One out of 10 people died in childbirth. Ugh, gross. So now that we're done with the S, let's go on to the intellectuals, and there's gonna be a few of them. There are a lot of intellectuals in the Italian Renaissance, and unfortunately we're not going to be able to list all of them, but we will go through a few of them. Now, before we get into these individuals, we have to talk about the idea of being a Renaissance man. The idea of having a lot of skills, or being the jack of all trades, being able to be skilled in one more than one area. 
The first two people we're going to talk about that were both Renaissance men themselves were the Bash Brothers of Humanism, Petrarch and Boccaccio. Now these olive crown wearing forefathers of humanism really set the bar in terms of humanism. They, not, they might not have influenced the idea that we know of humanism today, but they did influence later Renaissance poets, later Renaissance authors, and later Renaissance art, artists and architects. Now we're going to get into somebody else, Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli wrote a book called The Prince, and in The Prince he told people that, you know, if you want to be a, a better ruler, you have to be harsher. You have to rule kind of like with an iron fist. Why? Because even though he never said it, he said it was way better to be feared than loved. You would get better results that way because fear is consistent. Love can change. However, uh, that didn't get him very far because he did get exiled from Florence which is the city he was from. He was never also a prince. He was working for one. Another very important intellectual of the Italian Renaissance was Dante Alighieri, uh, the author of the Divine Comedy, also known as Dante's Inferno, not that crappy video game that was just a God of War ripoff. So Dante wrote a book, um, The Divine Comedy, and it scared the crap out of people because it gave this depiction of what hell was like, the nine levels of hell, all the people that were in hell, from the limbo area all the way down to the bottom level with the devil himself. And of course, while Dante is going through this, he's being guided by a Roman guy named Virgil. And Roman Virgil is the person who Dante looks up to, and it's just booming with this idea of Italian Renaissance. And of course, what happens is Dante is searching for the love of his life, Beatrice, a woman he barely even knew. So, yay Dante, hopeless romantic. Now let's talk about the artists. Leonardo da Vinci, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. The four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were named after very famous artists from this time period. Donatello for his sculpture of David, Leonardo da Vinci for the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, Michelangelo for La Pietà and the Sistine Chapel, and of course Raphael for School of Athens. Not only this, but these four gentlemen were also Renaissance men because they were also inventors, botanists, sculptors, and other sort of traits that made them who they were. So why is learning about the Italian Renaissance such an important aspect? Well, for the first thing, people argue that it was even a rebirth, that it was more of a revival or a recycle of knowledge that was already out there. For instance, if you look at the architecture, they're not reinventing the wheel. They're just reinventing columns and structures uh, for the most part. If you look at the math that's being done, that math had all already been figured out by the Muslim scholars in the Ottoman Empire and in the Muslim empires. Speaking of them, when they took the city of Constantinople and turned it into Istanbul, cue that they might be giant music, you have to look at what happened. All the scholars that were in those Christian universities that closed when they came in, they all left and fled to where? You guessed it, Italy. They all went to Italy and that's when their works were being translated. I'm pretty sure Copernicus also stole the idea of the heliocentric theory from a Muslim astrologist, but don't quote me on that. Pretty sure. Other than that, Yes, you could argue that Europe had its own revival of ideas or rebirth of ideas that were already there, but those ideas had already been thought of. People had already translated those works. People have already proven that there was a number zero. So when we look at Italy, when we talk about what happens and why it's such an important time for the Renaissance, you have to look at what happens after. And what happens after is that the Italian Renaissance is going to spread. It's going to spread to German region of the Europe, and it's going to spread to England and into France. And that's where we end this day. Thanks for watching.